begin our song service this morning with number 375. Oh, work for the night is coming. Work for the night is coming. Work for the night is coming. Work in the morning hours. Work for the day is sparkling. Work miss bringing flowers. Work while the day grows brighter under the glowing sun. Work for the night. Stand together as we sing for the last time the theme song for GYC.
Good morning, you may be seated. My name is Daryl. I'd like to welcome you to our final program here for GYC 2011. I'm a little bit sad. Are you a little bit sad? But I'm excited at the same time because I know the Holy Spirit will be here in a powerful way in the next few minutes as we continue with this program. It's fitting that we invite him to be with us here, so I just invite you to bow your heads with me as I say a quick word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity that we can once again hear your word. We invite the Holy Spirit for a last time at this convention this weekend to fill us because it's our earnest plea. May you be here now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. To start off this morning, I have a friend with me, Lauren. And I, Lauren, I understand you're a Bible worker, is that correct? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? And a little bit, I understand you have a story you want to share with all of us. Sure, yes. Well, I work for a ministry called The Ocas and the Acorn. And it's basically a ministry that helps place Bible workers that go to AFCO and Arise and graduate and want to share their enthusiasm with God with churches that want Bible workers. So currently, I work in Northern California in a very rural area, my partner and I. And um, it's been interesting for us because a lot of times when we go give Bible studies, we'll be sitting next to marijuana plants in literally a personal marijuana grove. And uh, it's not uncommon that they'll actually be smoking marijuana as we're giving the study. And uh, so that's been very interesting. And they are quickly to re quick to reassure me that oh, it's just for medicinal purposes, but it's neat to see how God is working in that area. The story I want to share with you is, comes from a community uh, it's a trailer home park there in Northern California, and uh, God is working in mighty ways there. One day we were giving a Bible study in one of the trailers, and we hear a knock on the door. And so we go and open the door, and there's a girl standing there, and she says, what are you doing? And we said, we're giving a Bible study. And she says, well, can I join you? She said, just this morning I was talking to my mom about what is truth. She said, I've been searching for truth, and I don't know what religion has the truth. My fiancé is interested in Luciferianism, and I just don't know what's truth. Can I study with you? And I just thought, wow, God is so good. He not only, you don't even just need to go knock on the door. Sometimes he'll bring them to your door. So God is such a wonderful God. And then in that same community, after studying for, there for a few months and knocking on doors, there's over half the people are interested in Bible studies. These people are just eager for the words of God. And so in giving the studies, um, one day when we went to study with our contacts there, they were t telling us, you know, ever since you've been here, things have gotten really rough. Things used to be easy, but now that over half of us are learning to love God and following Him, the other half are giving us a really hard time. And one lady said that she um, feels that her house is demon-possessed every night. There's shadows on her walls. Um, and then the people that aren't following Christ, that don't want us in here giving Bible studies, or receiving the Bible studies from you, are causing a really hard time. One man even brought in a gun and threatened us and said, give up that, you know, don't talk to those people. And so... You know, it's just, you can see the great controversy being played out, but, you know, it's, we don't need to get discouraged because um, God is really working their hearts, and they're eager and, and earnest to go share Him. Absolutely. Lauren, can you tell me a little bit, how many contacts have you reached, and what's some of the results of your uh, Bible work, where, where you're at? Sure. Well, with just six Bible workers in Northern California, in the last five months, we um, have given over a thousand Bible studies, in-home Bible studies, so people there are eager to hear the Word. In can the you last get, say amen to that? In the last two years, there's been over 60 baptisms. 60 baptisms. Now, Lauren, often some of us may have a perception that, you know, you have to be some sort of specific caliber to be a Bible worker. Is that correct? You need to have a passion and desire to serve God with all your heart, you know. And anyone can do that, you know. Just go share your faith. Ellen White talks about how, you know, the oak is in the acorn, and how the little things you do, just sharing with your neighbor or your your aunt that doesn't know Jesus, anyone, just talking to them, can grow into big oak trees for God when they give their hearts to Him. Can you say amen to that? You know, I'm excited, and I hope you have been excited about this story as well. Everyone here sitting in this audience can do something for Jesus. And if you're interested in doing Bible work, think about it, pray about it, as we come into our program this, e this afternoon. May you continue to be blessed as we listen to more testimonies and listen to God's Word. Amen. Good morning, GYC. Good morning. We would like to share with you something that is exciting that is happening. And that is this, that what is happening here at GYC is not just in Houston, Texas. 
but it's happening across the world and across North America. And here with me, we have all of the different GYC affiliate conferences with us. And we are going to ask them to share with us how the Lord specifically is working through their conference. Peter? Morning, GYC. My name is Peter Chung. I'm from GYC Southwest. That represents Southern California and Arizona. Uh, one powerful testimony was that two weeks before SWYC started, there was a young person that was in a gang fight and he was almost killed. His sister compelled him to come to SWYC and he found Jesus there through the sanctuary message. And now he comes to church consistently. Amen. And where is your conference at this next year? It's going to be at Pine Springs Ranch, August 31 to September 3. Our theme is restoring the Adventist home to finish the work. Amen. Amen. My name is Doug Houghton. I represent Western Youth Conference, GYC West. This year, the young people asked for training, and so we're working with local ministries in the area to provide literature evangelism training, medical missionary training, so pray for us as we work with those 25 churches. This year, our theme will be Fall Afresh. We will be meeting at Weimar, California, from June 27 to July 1. Amen. Beautiful. My name is Brennan Vanek. I'm representing Acts for Christ, based out of Western Canada. This past year's conference, we had our very first prayer meeting room, and we had blessings that we did not even anticipate. A friend of mine came and told me that this is her last chance opportunity to save her marriage as well as her relationship with the Lord. She later on told us, as a testimony to the whole conference, that after hours in the prayer room, her marriage and her relationship with the Lord had been completely renewed. Amen. They are both currently active members in their local church. Amen. Amen. This year's conference is gonna be in Vancouver, British Columbia, April 5 to 8, and the theme is Dying to Live. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sebastian Henry, and I am here for um, GYC Atlantic. And so this year, our goal has really been to help establish young people and their practical Christianity. And so we set up those devotional phone calls, and um, it's been a great blessing for them in general. One young man in particular has expressed how this has contributed to his um, spiritual growth and even a revival in his own life. And so our conference, um, which is coming up this April from the 22nd um, to the 20, 20, from the 20th to the 22nd, sorry, um, will be in Newport, Rhode Island. Awesome. Thank you so much. My name is Anna Coney, and I represent the Southern Youth Conference. We're based in Dallas, Texas. We serve Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and New Mexico. Um, many of the young people who come to our conference are in search of ways that they can get involved and active in their local churches, so we always provide extra activities to show them different ways to get involved. We, we're not just limited to the door-to-door -door ministries, but we take our attendees to nursing homes to visit those who are, who are stuck there. We, um, we help them, we train them how to get involved in um, health ministries, and we also train them how to start uh, student ministries at their campuses. Awesome. Our next conference will be June 28th to July 1st at the Richardson Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you. And the theme is Crucified. Amen. I'm Jared Collins representing GYC Great Lakes, covering the states of Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, and Indiana, and neighboring states. Um, the Lord has really been working through small group and prayer groups uh, following the presentations at our conference. Uh, we're also planning a youth planned and youth preached evangelistic series that will happen in the fall. We've already had one training session. Our conference will serve as a second and we'll have a third uh, before that uh, series. Our next conference is President's Day weekend, February 17 to 19 on the campus of Andrews University. Amen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniel Arroyo and I represent GYC Southeast uh, in so Southern Adventist University. And uh, this last conference, we had a real blessing. We had over 50 people give their lives to Christ, Amen. Uh, requesting uh, Bible studies, baptisms, rebaptisms, and something really cool that GYC Southeast is currently working on is we're working on outreaching to the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, which is nearby, and our goal is to have college students from Southern outreach to college students from UTC, and we eventually want to have service there every Sabbath. And our conference for this coming year, well, in August, uh, 10 through 13, is a living testimony from theory to experience. And in where Southern is that Adventist Daniel? University. Southern Adventist University. Yeah, in College Dale, Tennessee. Thank you. My name is Mark Anthony Valadez. I represent GYC and Espanol. We are a national ministry. Um, thanks to uh, the Lord, 3ABN, Audioverse, our movement is growing worldwide. Amen. I'd like to say hello to the young people from GYC that want to start GYC Colombia, GYC Ecuador, GYC Mexico, etc. Um, 
This year's conference is going to be in uh, uh, Fresno, California. The theme is Recibiréis Poder, which means ye shall receive power. And uh, we'll be ha having it at Fresno, California, June 21st. Uh, through the 24th. For more information, you can visit gycesp.org. And really quick, someone may be thinking, how am I going to get to Fresno, California? Well, I'll share with you real quick. In the previous conference, there were some young people that wanted to attend our conference in Texas, but they weren't able to. So what they did, believe it or not, sell oranges. They sold oranges. They were able to raise money, and they were able to attend uh, the conference. And on the way back, when they went back to their home church, they were able to present a week-long message of everything that they learned. One person shows from each seminar they attended, and they were already shared they're still active in evangelism. And one of these young ladies is going to be serving as part of the econ for GYC in Español. Hope to see you there. God bless you. Mercy. Can someone say amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming soon, brothers and sisters, and we would challenge you, we'd inspire you to get involved with your own lo local youth conference. And if you would like more information um, on how to contact these individuals, if you go to the website gycweb.org, you can find the contact information and attend these youth conferences. Hope you have safe travels and a happy new year. Feliz año. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, YC presidents. And we also want to recognize that this time there are many organizations, youth movements out there who are not necessarily affiliated with GYC, yet are doing a great job. And we also want to take this time to thank you for all that you do to advance the cause of God. In a little bit, we are going to have our charge, our final charge. But before that, we want to take care of a few items, in-house items. The GYC group is uh, an organization of young people that have one mission, and that is to share Jesus with everyone in our generation. This means that the people that you see before you who are currently serving as the executive committee are not serving in these positions for any other reason simply other than simply because they believe and we believe that they can play a special role in helping us to fulfill that mission. We don't receive positions on the GYC Executive Committee because of talent or because of politics or popularity. This is not something that takes place, but takes place through a popular vote, but it takes place through the prayerful consideration of the board and through interaction with young people who have proven themselves to want to follow Jesus with all of their hearts. And so because of this, each of our young people here today do not hold on to positions, but they simply serve for a certain amount of time and they press on to allow others to experience that same joy of service. This year's executive committee has done a great job for the last several years, actually. We have two-year terms, and I want to introduce them to you. You have them there on your bulletin. We have Justin McNeilis, who serves as our current president, Yamil Rosario, Sebastian Praxton. They're both general vice presidents. Amy Shepard has served as our executive secretary. Aaron McNulty, who gave such a, a, a great appeal, uh, on Sabbath for the finances is our treasure. Chelsea, I can't say your last name, Chelsea, because it was Jordan, but it just changed. She got married. She was our vice president for evangelism. Brandon was uh, our vice president for communications. Alana Smith is in charge of our logistics, and Sean Reed was responsible for the programming that each of us enjoyed so much during this past year. We are now in a transition year, and as a result of that, I'm going to invite our new executive committee to come out as a result of that, we have a transition from this executive committee to, an, to a new executive committee. This, is not, this does not mean that any of the young people up here did a bad job and now we're replacing them. That's not the reason why they are moving forward. To be an executive committee member takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of sacrifice, and in reality it's a, such a huge responsibility that no one with their right mind would want to hold on to it for too long. And so there is a transition period that we are going through at this time. And we have expanded our executive committee by a couple of departments because we believe that we are only getting closer and closer to the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And so I want to leave our executive committee, or some of our members will be leaving us, some will be staying. I want to leave you with the words of Paul to the Corinthian church that is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. I was a missionary at the University of Michigan, and when it was time for me to go, this was a verse that was read to me that impacted my life in such a great way, and I want to share that with you today. 
It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You move forward from the GYC Executive Committee, but your labor does not end. You continue pressing on the work of God wherever you go, and you continue pressing forth, calling young people to faithfulness to the Word of God with a promise that no matter what you do, your labor is never in vain in the Lord. Thank you so much for your service. The new executive committee, you have a big responsibility upon your shoulders, and I want to briefly introduce the new executive committee uh, to you. We're keeping Justin McNeilis as a president of GYC. He's a vice president. I, uh, he's a vice president of Sterling State Bank. I almost messed up with that. Sterling State Bank, and he's, by the way, one of the greatest bankers we've ever met. Amy Shepard, General Vice President, is an attorney in the state of Michigan. Valmi, we have a new, uh, a new position. Valmi over here will be serving as the assistant to the president, helping the president with his responsibilities. We have Livy Knott, who's right next to Valmi, Olivia Knott, I should say, who is, by the way, the youngest executive committee member ever in the history of GYC. When GYC started, she was only seven years old. Now she's, our executive, uh, now she's our executive secretary, amen? We have Alana Smith. Alana Smith, everyone knows Alana. She is our new treasurer, and she, uh, she's a business manager in British Columbia in Canada. We, we won't hold that against her. Jeffrey Marshall, he's a chaplain uh, at, at uh, Bass Memorial Academy. He's actually our oldest member of the executive committee. And by the way, you're also even older than me. Yeah, 32, so he's the oldest person on this stage. Brandon, Vice President for Communications. You can tell that he's the Vice President for Communications because he's got the crazy hairstyle, which distracts people from my glasses, so that's a good thing. <laughs> he, he's from Light Bears in Oregon. Natasha Neblet from uh, New Mexico. She's a student. Natasha, where are you? Here's Natasha. We have uh, Alvin Cardona. Alvin, where are you here? Alvin Cardona, he's, uh, oh, by the way, Natasha is going to be responsible for our logistics department, replacing Alana. It's a huge responsibility. Please keep her in prayer. Alvin's going to be responsible for our programming, and he, uh, he's a student at Southern Adventist University. We have Michelle Lee, who comes to us from the secular campus world. Michelle Lee is vice president for resources. She's a student in California at Stanford. And we have Tando Malambo. Her name is nice because it kind of rhymes there. Tando Malambo. She will be our vice president for missions. We are expanding the departments of GYC to also include missions. And we have finally Grace Shim, who will be responsible for our networking. Grace Shim is responsible for our networking. And she's a social media coordinator from uh, Atlanta. There's considerable changes taking place in our e-coms here. Our e-com that is leaving is a lot older than our e-com that is entering. Our e-com that is entering is now of the average age, I have to say this because Livy did the not, uh, <laughs> Livy did the math. Her last name is not. Livy did the math. Average age is 24.91667. I just rounded up to 25, but that's the average age of the Ecom that is coming, the average age of the ecom that is going is 28 because we got rid of Tom O'Weedy several years ago, otherwise it would have been like 30 or 35. <laughs> this, by the way, presents some significant challenges and at the same time significant opportunities. Young people, you're coming in and you're a lot younger than the ecom that is leaving for the most part. That means that you have less experience, less wisdom. The good news is that the Lord does not need experience and wisdom. He needs willingness, and that's all he needs. And so, as you enter into this new position, I'd like to share with you a few points, and that is this, that first of all, things from this point on will only get tougher. The leadership that is coming in will have more difficult challenges than the e-com that is leaving. And this, by the way, will continue to be the trend. As we continue to live in this difficult world filled with challenges, things will only get more difficult. And so it's time for the commitment of our leadership to rise higher and higher and higher. You were chosen for the positions not so much because of the talents that you possess, and you possess great and many talents. 
but you are chosen for the positions that you hold today simply because of the people that we knew within our sphere of influence and the people that you knew recognize that in you there was a desire to sacrifice for the cause of God. That is, by the way, the only reason why you hold the positions that you hold. And so if the time comes in the morning when you wake up and you don't feel a sense of sacrifice, that is also the time for you to step down from the position that you hold. Success depends not upon the talents that you possess, but simply and only upon the faithfulness in which you do the tasks that have been assigned to you. In closing, I want to read to you from the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, as Paul is getting ready to transition his way out, making room for new leadership, says this in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 3. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him or her to be a soldier. As you get ready to take the position from this day forward, January 1, as you get ready to take your position from this day forward, please remember this. Endure hardness like a good soldier. Don't get up in the morning with a complaining spirit that the task that you have is too difficult, that you do not have the time to do it, that it's just impossible to do. Don't complain, but like a good soldier, endure hardness, and hardness will come. Hardness will come from within, hardness will come from without. But like a good soldier, endure that hardness. And then here you have the counsel from Paul, no one, no one that wars, we're in a time of war, we don't fight with guns, we don't fight with muscle, but we fight with faithfulness to the Word of God. No man, no woman that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. There are many things in this world that are great things. Many things in this world that are great things. Study, education is great. Friendship is great. Family is great. Entertainment is great. Many things in this world that are great, but no one in a time of war, a soldier that is involved in war, puts aside even great things if they are distraction from the work that they are called to do. No one, no one that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Why? Because you have someone that you are called to please, and your general is not Justin McNeilis. Your general is not Israel Ramos. Your general is not the board of directors, your general is Jesus Christ himself. So as you move forward, don't forget your identity. From the very beginning of GYC, we've sought to work with the church. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Don't let anyone fool you to think that now you are the generation that's going to work with it. We have been working with the church. You are the church. Amen. Everyone here today is the church. The church is composed of the body of Christ. You continue to work with that body, and you continue to strengthen it by placing aside anything that distracts us from accomplishing the task that God has called us to do. And if the time comes for us, if the time comes for us to lay aside this position for the next person to come in, let it be said of you that you have been a good soldier. Let's pray to that end. Please, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me as we have a prayer of blessing upon this group of people. I'm going to invite GYC, if you could, in the audience, if you could please stand with me as we pray for these young people and we ask the Lord to bless them. Our Father in heaven, we gather together for a very sacred moment. We are transitioning a leadership from the past to the leadership of the future. Father, we thank you for the people that have served this ECOM so faithfully through the last two years, through the last four years, six years. We're thankful for them. Bless them as they move forward in the future. Lord, give them new responsibilities. Help them, Father, to just grow from this place instead of shrinking. And may the things that they accomplish for the cause of God be greater even than the things that they accomplish for GYC. And Father, as we bring in a new ECOM, a young ECOM, we thank you so much for the gift of youth. 
Lord, with all the energy, with all the idealism that you've instilled in their being, give them success. Success that is so great that it surpasses human understanding. Success that is so great that can only be recognized as divine success. Father, we have church leaders here. Lord, give us as ministers, give us as church leaders, give us wisdom in dealing with this group of people. Help us to strengthen their hands. Help us to encourage them by the way. And help the work that they accomplish be a work that is strengthened and supported by the ministry of the gospel. As they move forward, Father, we ask that you would help them to not be distracted, but to with persistence attack the cause of the devil with all that they've got, even unto death. Keep us faithful to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
of East and West, of sinner and of saint. But this I know, a flesh shall see His glory, and He shall reap the harvest He has sown. Thank you for the special music. This morning I'd like to invite our, our final speaker of GYC, Sebastian Braxton. You just saw him before. This will be the last message of GYC this year. You don't know about him. Is This guy is my biological brother. <laughs> we were together for the Lord at campus at the Michigan Conference. And uh, in many ways, we are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, he's got bigger eyes than I do, uh, a little bit darker skin than I do. It's a bit more buffer than I am. But in many ways, we are, we are brothers, uh, stronger than, than biological brothers. It's my privilege to introduce him uh, as the speaker this morning. Sebastian, it's been 10 years since GYC started. One full decade has come and passed. And we praise the Lord of how He's worked and, and, and amazing things He's done. But we still have a work to do. Amen, everyone? And uh, now that you're joining me in GYC retirement, you're at the old age of 31, <laughs> over the mountain, um, give us a message directly from the throne of God. This is the last message of this decade of GYC. I ask you to bow your heads with me. Gracious Father, we want to hear a good message, Lord. We want to hear a good message. Father, we, want, we don't want to hear a message that's funny or interesting or, or, or theologically sound only. But Father, we want to hear directly from the throne of God. 
So, Father, for any faults, any weaknesses, any things that, are, that, that blind us, for our ears and minds, we ask that you cleanse them all, and for the lips of my brother, his mind and his heart, may there be a clear channel. Father, fill us. Fill him. This is our earnest plea. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, GYC. Good morning, GYC. I thought this was a generation of youth. You guys sound tired. I was praying this morning, and the idea came to me to send a text message to my mother and father. And I said, Mommy, Daddy, I'm speaking. 10.30 this morning, and uh, if you want to tune in, you can watch. I don't think my father has ever seen me preach before. About 30 minutes later, my father texted me back, and he said, I'll be there. Then my mom called me backstage, and uh, she gave me a little talking. We'll get into that later in the sermon. You know how mothers are. And she said, I'm going to be praying for you, and she'll be watching. And so there's nothing more peaceful than knowing that your mom is praying for you. Amen? And so if my parents are watching, I just want to say hello, good morning, and I love you, and I'm thankful for your prayers and support. I also want to extend my thanks to my wife as well. I know she's praying for me too. We are on the verge of a new day. And this is what I'd like to title my message this morning. A new day. Did you guys see that GYC Europe video last night? How many of you guys saw that? Were you blessed by that? Are you excited? I, I cannot tell you how excited I was when I saw that video tears almost started coming to my eyes. And it reminded me of a statement I read in the book Ministry of Healing, where the statement says, if we are not developing the active graces of the Spirit, the latter rain will be poured out and falling all around us, and we will not know. For many of you, you had no idea what was going on in Europe until last night. And the spirit, I can tell you firsthand, is falling upon youth in Europe. I can tell you firsthand, the spirit is falling upon Africa. The spirit is falling upon Asia. The spirit is falling upon South America. But the question of GYC is, what's happening in North America? Is the spirit falling upon North America? And in having this conference, in trusting with the council of the spirit of prophecy, if there could be a convocation of all the churches of the earth, the object of their united cry should be for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Here we come, near and far, 66 countries represented at this very conference, gathered together for one prayer, and then we also announced our theme for next year. Do you guys remember what that theme was? Acts, the revolution continues. I was also excited about that theme as well. But when you say Acts, the revolution continues, you can only continue something if it has already begun. And in order to understand that Acts was the beginning of the revolution, this conference is about studying the beginning of that revolution. And that every single person in this room, every single person watching at home or live streaming anywhere around the world or around the country, is a person that is saying, fill us, Lord, just like you filled the disciples so that we can continue the revolution. However, we are not asking for more of the same. 
Because whatever Peter and Paul and James and Philip and Stephen did, it didn't end the world. And so the need of the Holy Spirit is not so that we can do what Peter did, but it's to do more than Peter did. It's to do more than Luther, more than Wesley, more than Zwingli, more than Wycliffe, more than translators who have put the Bible in over 200 languages by the movings of the Holy Spirit. A new day is upon us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you know that this man is but dust in your sight. But it is our prayer that you would breathe upon him breath of God, that you would fill him with life anew, and that from this quiet place of audience with God, you would send him forth only to speak your words, that he would be captive to the Word of God and into the Holy Spirit. May that sweet, sweet Spirit of Jesus be upon each soul, carrying the Word of God to the life. We know the Spirit can even reach those who watch by television or by website. Ignite something on this earth that will bring about a new day. This is our prayer, and we trust that you will help this to be our experience. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. There are certain situations in life where adding something always makes a difference, sometimes makes a difference, or never makes a difference. For example, I like to use food, it's clear, everyone resonates with it, so it's simple. I don't like watermelon. And when I was growing up, you know, my family began to check my DNA. Are you really black? <laughs> you don't like watermelon. And, and, I, and, you know, sometimes people would say it wasn't ripe enough or you, you didn't get the right kind of watermelon or you need to add salt to the watermelon or you need to add sugar. It doesn't matter. Whatever you add to it, it will never be the same. Are you with me? But also, I, I had another experience where this is going to just deepen the issue. I also grew up and I completely dislike collard greens. Now, my family... Thanksgiving dinner, every year I, I committed to my mom, and if she's watching, she knows this is true. God is my witness. I only ate collard greens once a year on Thanksgiving just to please my mom. But I hate them. And it was interesting that years later, I went to a friend's house for Thanksgiving, and while we were there, they were asking me, oh, you know we're going to have collard greens. I know you love collard greens. Uh, no, I don't. And they said, well, I think the reason is, is because there's vinegar in the collard greens. I said, vinegar? Why would you put vinegar in the collard greens? It's just a tradition. I suspect that's probably why you don't like collard greens. So she said, I don't put vinegar in mine. You can taste it. And if you don't like it, then so be it. You don't like collard greens. So she cooked that pot of collard greens, no vinegar. I took one fork full of GYC. And I'm telling you, it was the best flavor I ever had in my life. There was nothing left in the pot after that. I don't think I ate anything else except collard greens. And I realized that if you add something, if you, you take something away, or sometimes it changes. Watermelon, it doesn't matter what you add to it for me. It will never be the same. For collard greens, if you take out the vinegar, it's, it's always going to taste good to me. But there's sometimes... It changes things, and sometimes adding something does not. And so in our prayer to be filled with the Holy Spirit, fill me our earnest plea, I want to go with you on a particular journey this morning over three main topics. For those of you who've taken notes and you like your stuff to be organized, this is the lay of the land. This is the trajectory. 
This is kind of the sermonic cartography of where we're going. First of all, we're going to look at it's never the same. It's never the same. The second issue we'll look at is it sometimes is the same. And thirdly, we'll look at it's always the same. So let's see if you got those. The first one is what? Never. It's never the same. The, th the second one is? Sometimes the same. The third one is? Always the same. Are you ready? Number one. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We're going to be speeding through the Bible, and so you need your fingers very limber, dexterous, and ready to turn. So if you have a phone, you'll probably be left behind. Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. When you're there, you can say amen. If you're not there, say have mercy. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Are you there? Yes, the Bible says this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit did what? Gave utterance. Now I want you to notice the elements of this Pentecostal outpouring. Number one, the day of Pentecost was fully come. Number two, all of the church was gathered into one place and was unified. Number three, they heard the sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And fourthly, it divided among them tongues as a fire. Now oftentimes when we're talking about Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you, we like lingo. So we say things like, you know, what are you praying for for GYC? What are you excited? I'm hoping that when we get to Houston, the place is going to be shaken. There's going to be a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. Cloven tongues as of fire are going to fall upon the congregation in Houston. And I want to suggest to you there are certain elements in this Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit that are incidental and there are certain elements that are essential. So let me take you to the subsequent outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. First of all, let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. When you're there, you can say amen. Acts chapter 4, just a couple chapters over. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 4, the disciples were praying after persecution. We're in verse 31. The Bible says, for true when they had prayed... The place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were, how many filled? All filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God with what? Boldness. That's our theme text for this conference, by the way. It says, when they had prayed, number one. In Acts chapter 2, when the disciples had the Holy Spirit come upon them, the Bible says they were sitting. They weren't praying. Number two, the Bible says in verse 31 of Acts chapter 4, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. What was the place? It was shaken. Now, was the place shaken in Acts chapter 2, yes or no? It's okay to talk to the preacher. Was the place shaken in Acts chapter 2? No, it was not. So we see they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, but the elements of this outpouring were not the same. Do you see that in the text, yes or no? Let's look at another one. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 14. Are you there? Say amen. amen. The Bible says, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon how many of them? None of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice here again, did you see anything shaking in this verse? Yes or no? Did you hear a sound as of a rushing mighty wind? Yes or no? 
No, did, did, you, did you see any divided tongues of fire, yes or no? No. So now we, we go to one more place in the book of Acts, just two chapters over, Acts chapter 10. We looked at this for our church service yesterday. Acts chapter 10. We're going to be looking in verse 44. Are you there? Say amen. All right, the Bible says this. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then they asked him to stay a few days. Now, I want you to notice a huge difference here. In Acts chapter 2, we have day of Pentecost is fully calm, sound as of a rushing mighty wind. Then we go forward and see their dividing clove, cloven tongues of fire lighting upon each of them. Acts chapter 4, the place is shaken. Acts chapter 8, there's nothing shaking, no wind, no fire. We go to Acts chapter 10, it's while the word is being preached. And then on top of that, we find that Cornelius and his household received the Holy Spirit before baptism. When in Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every feeling is not the same. In fact, it's never the same. So the question is, what are we looking for at this conference to take place? What are we expecting to happen in this auditorium? That when the Holy Spirit comes down, does the place need to be shaken? Does there need to be sound of a rushing mighty wind? Does there need to be cloven tongues of fire dividing upon every forehead in this auditorium? Yes or no? No, I want to suggest to you that these elements of Pentecost were incidental, not essential. And let me share with you, in each situation, what were those essential components of every filling of the Holy Spirit? Number one, I'm going to give you three quick points, and then we got to rush on. Number one, in every outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there was an acceptance and a reception of the life and the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the placement of Jesus Christ. That was accepted, it was received, and they were surrendered to that every single time. You see, Jesus was exalted as the only means of salvation. Can you say amen? Is Jesus the only way, yes or no? Is Jesus the only means out of sin, yes or no? Yes, and as Jesus was exalted, as Jesus was put forth, the multitude said, yes, we accept Christ. And as they accepted Christ's work in his behalf, in their behalf, the next element we find is there's prayer every time. Ellen White reminds us we need not expect revival except an answer to prayer. There is no way to experience revival without prayer. No way to get the Holy Spirit unless we ask. Jesus is very clear that our Heavenly Father is more willing to give us the Holy Spirit than evil parents are to give good gifts to their children. To give to those who ask Him. Number three, there was an entire surrender to Jesus. It is unfortunate that sometimes in the church we do not apply the test of discipleship upon those four candidates for baptism as much as we should. You see, we find ourselves arguing over doctrines we've already accepted because people before they came in were not fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. So you see, the, the, the bottom line issue is, if every soul was committed to the life and the teachings of Jesus, would be no argument, because Christ's words would settle it. 
And in fact, we are told once again, for all intents and purposes, Jesus was a seven-day Adventist. That's a weak amen. 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 For all intents and purposes, every doctrine we hold can be found in the Gospels. And yet in this sense, we come in and we say, man, you know, this person came in and we baptized you because you got information, but you haven't surrendered. Is Jesus Lord? Is the question. Before you come in, Christ is the head of the church, and if we are not submitted to the head, then what? The test. And this is also the line before we can receive the Spirit of God. And I'm wondering in this auditorium, is Jesus really Lord? Have we really submitted entirely to Christ? It does not take an individual to have to come all the way to Houston to find it. I was reading right before I came to GYC. She says our camp meetings would be more powerful if our members found Jesus at home before they came. But individuals come looking for Christ and praise God, Jesus is preached. Amen? Amen. Not against that. But how much more powerful would it have been that everyone who entered this auditorium said, I already found Christ in my living room. I was already in my room bowing before the Lord saying, Lord, is there anything left that I haven't given? It's yours. It's yours. This is what heaven is waiting for that when that third coming happens and the millennium is over, she says, there is Christ exalted on his throne. All the wicked, all the righteous are standing there watching the scenes of the crucifixion in panorama view. And every knee will bow, including Lucifer, and will say, Christ is Lord. We will say it one way or the other. But if we want to be filled, we have to always remember we must accept what Jesus has done. We must pray, and we must be completely surrendered. You see, when we say be filled with the Holy Spirit, we we think of a vessel, do we not? We, We think of this bottle of water or this cup We want to put water and fill this cup. And we're saying, Lord, fill my cup, Lord, fill this vessel. But you see, it's it's misleading. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not so much about Him coming in to fill us and so we can go forward. It's about how much of the Holy Spirit has us. Not much how much of the Holy Spirit do we have. We don't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. We don't possess him, he possesses us. And therefore we will have as much of the Holy Spirit as much as he has of us. Can you say amen? Amen. This is the critical component. Time is leaving me, I cannot linger. Point number two, it's sometimes the same. So we see that certain things are incidental, certain things are essential, but sometimes even though the Holy Spirit comes down, things are the same. I'm going to give you seven points. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. When you're there, say amen. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Are you there? The Bible says this, Then those who gladly received His word were baptized. And that day, about how many souls? How many souls? Come on, GYC. I know you're excited about the Word of God. Yes or no? How many souls? Amen. 3,000 souls were baptized, but point number one, just because you're filled with the Spirit doesn't mean everyone will accept. 3,000 were baptized, not all. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes or no? Yes. Were thousands brought in? Yes or no? Was that all? No. You see, some of us are coming here and saying, Lord, I haven't felt power in my ministry. I have a mother at home. I have a brother at home. I have a classmate. I have a professor staunch into atheism and evolutionary biology. 
someone I'm trying to reach at home, someone I'm trying to reach maybe even in this auditorium. I'm trying to reach them, Lord, and we think if we come here and we get the filling of the Holy Spirit, then now the person will accept the gospel. But we see what Peter's preaching. Many came, but not all. And there are some things that is just the same. It doesn't mean because you go home and you witness to your brother or your mother or your friend and they don't accept, it doesn't mean you weren't filled with the Spirit. Are you following what I'm saying? We can easily go back and become discouraged, yes or no? We can easily go back and say, am I really filled? I was wrestling for a young man just two nights ago in this conference while you were listening to a message. I was wrestling with a young soul. Conversation after conversation, word after word, phrase after phrase, back and forth, back and forth, and he still was resisting. And at the end of the conversation, I had to walk away, and my heart was breaking inside, and I'm thinking, Lord, am I not filled? Do I not have the Spirit? And the Bible is saying, no, Sebastian. No, brother and sister out there at GYC. You can be filled and go home, and people will still not accept Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit, yes or no? Yes. Did, the whole, did the rich young ruler walk away, yes or no? Yes. To walk away from Jesus, who was filled? Point number two, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. The Bible says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan done what? Why has Satan done what? Filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Did you know in the time of a spirit-filled church, there was still a need for fear? At this particular time, point number two, being filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean there's no, no hypocrisy. There's going to be some individuals like Ananias and Sapphira who are going to sense the filling of the Holy Spirit, who are going to be moved like they were and say, you know what, I'm going to sell all my possessions. I'm going to sell it and bring it to the apostles' feet so that they can distribute it to those who have need. But privately, what was happening in Ananias' home was completely different. And Ellen White tells us God dealt harshly to show his distaste for hypocrisy. You see, being filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean that all of a sudden our community, we're all going to be completely authentic, 100% sold out Christians for Christ. And Ananias was still able to be filled by Satan to conceive something in his heart even though he felt the unction of the Holy Spirit. And it's important that you and I recognize this. This is the Spirit-filled church in encountering all these kind of issues. And we're saying, Lord, how in the world? This is the church that's filled with the Holy Spirit? This is the church that received Pentecost? The answer is yes. It is. Some things are still the same. It's sometimes just the same as before we added the Holy Spirit. Point number three, quickly. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, we get internal issues. The Bible says, now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. 
Number three, still internal issues after the church was filled. How in the world can you be filled but you're neglecting people because they're Greek Jews? It still happens. And this is the church that was filled. We saw Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, still unwilling to go minister to Gentiles. God had to give him a vision, but he was filled. It doesn't make a difference right away. But if we continue to surrender to the Holy Spirit, it will make a difference. Are you still with me? Yes or no? I got to rush on. You can write these things in your notes. In Acts chapter 10, we see that the Spirit-filled church, as we said with Peter, still had skill, skewed understandings, subject to culture. Point number five, we see in Acts chapter 12 when Peter is released from prison and he's going and knocking at the gate and a girl named Rhoda is there at the gate. And she sees Peter and she's so surprised because Peter was in jail. The church is praying for Peter. Lord, please free this apostle. Peter's at the door and they say, you're beside yourself. So we see here we have a spirit-filled church still struggling with faith. Here you are praying and you don't believe that the apostle came out of jail? But this was the church that was filled. And in Acts 15, the Spirit-filled church still needed to counsel together. It is very dangerous when a person thinks, because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I have nothing left to learn. That I don't need to counsel with my brethren, experienced and otherwise. Paul was filled, James was filled, Peter was filled, but in Acts 15, when they had that counsel in Jerusalem, they still, all Spirit-filled, said, we need to counsel together. This is a Spirit-filled church. But many of us think, oh yeah, once I get the Holy Spirit, I'm led by the Spirit. I don't need to counsel with my brother. I don't need to counsel with my sister. Yes, we do. James, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, all filled with the Holy Spirit said, we need to come together and counsel. Ask God, what do we do with this matter? Now, let's get to the good stuff. Point number three, it's always the same. The disciples before and after Pentecost. I want to give you a few observations as I go into these final points. In the Gospels, we know that the disciples were struggling with being obsessed with Christ setting up an earthly kingdom or a heavenly kingdom. An earthly kingdom. So you have the disciples are like, Lord, when are you going to set it up? In Acts chapter 1, let's turn there. Acts chapter 1, the Bible says, listen. As Christ commands them to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in verse 6 of Acts chapter 1, they said, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? But after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, does this ever come up again? It does not in the book of Acts. Never again do you find a disciple saying, we're trying to set up an earthly kingdom. Number two, in the Gospels we see the, the disciples cowardly and avoiding the cross. And yet after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we see the disciples embracing suffering and persecution. Before in the Gospels the disciples asked all the questions. In the book of Acts, the disciples were answering them. All you see is the disciples, Lord, what do you mean you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? How is that possible? Lord, why can I not follow you? All you hear is Lord with a question. You go into the book of Acts, the disciples are answering them. In the Gospels, we see the disciples struggling to pray. You're with Jesus on the mountain, transfiguration, falling asleep. And yet here we go in the book of Acts, we see the disciples have no problem praying. Peter's on the rooftop, taking his own personal time. And the church is always in prayer in the book of Acts. 
Now, let's deal with the specifics as we head towards the finish line. In Acts chapter 2, I'm going to go through these very quickly. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, you can't gather all the church into one place anymore. The closest thing you have is the general conference, and that's still not everyone in the church, 14 million or 17 million, whatever the number is now. So we can't get all in one physical place, but the Bible does say there was unity. This is always the same. In order for the Spirit to be poured out, there must be unity. There must be what? Unity. Unity. The Bible says they were all in one accord. Okay, it's, 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 it's this Greek word that's oftentimes associated with music, harmonies. Yes, you have different notes, but strung together, they make a beautiful music. Did you appreciate that music yesterday? Yes, deeply blessed. But it was saying like this orchestra concept in Greek to say, look, all these things, and 10 out of the 12 times, this word is used in the New Testament, it's in the book of Acts. That the Spirit-filled church was about unity. You see, my father used to have this saying, I'm the oldest of seven children. And my father used to say, as he sat us down, the strength of the wolf is the pack, and the strength of the pack is the wolf. And he would would sit us down and he would say, listen, why is it that a pack of wolves can eat? Number one, the strength of the wolf is the pack. A wolf by himself cannot catch anything. He'll run and run and run. I don't know if you've seen that Planet Earth DVD, and you see the wolf chasing down the gazelle just forever in the mountains. And it says as long as the, you know, the little gazelle doesn't lose its footing, the wolf will never catch it. And so this is why wolves hunt alone. I mean, they don't hunt alone. Sorry. (laughs) This is why wolves don't hunt alone. Because the wolf understands in a pack, we will almost always eat because we hunt together. But at the same time, the strength of the pack is the individual wolf. Because if one wolf decides, hey, you know, we're running along, and as the wolves are hunting, hey, we see it. You go left, I go right. And the person who goes right says he's running right to catch just to make sure the deer doesn't come off. And he says, wow, look at that sunset. (laughs) And as the wolf pulls over and looks at the sunset, what happens? The deer gets away. How many wolves starve? All of them. Because the strength of the pack is the what? Wolf. It's no different within the church. You see, we have an in, a, a, a individual responsibility, and this is why I love what Cameron was saying. Righteousness is not just about my purity. It's easy to be holy in my room. It's easy to be holy when I got my own diet and I'm cooking my own food. It's different when you come to potluck. Amen. <laughs> and here's the issue is how do, how do I live a righteous life with a community? It's a whole new level of righteousness. And I want to tell you, I'm completely supportive of exhibits. I'm completely supportive of ministries that are going on. But one of my concerns, one of my prayers, and I believe Christ as well, too much individually pushing our ministry. You see, at the day of Pentecost, it wasn't just the lower people, the laity that was praying. It was the leaders, the individuals that were powerful. You have a church through Paul, Apollos, Peter. And can you imagine if you take amazing facts, you take light bearers and arise, you take life, you take campus, you take stride, you take mission college, and all these people come together and are praying under one passion, which is to see the Lord come. No longer fighting over recruits. No longer determine, well, why should I go to arise? Why should I go to campus? Just go get training. Amen. And it's turned into this divine hour is commercial hour. Something is happening is commercial hour. When in reality, the church was unified. I'm happy if a young person goes to Arise as an employee of campus. I'm happy that a soul goes to AFCO. I'm happy that someone goes to peace. As long as that soul is saying, Lord, you are with me. 
If you're praying, Lord, how can I do something to hasten the second coming of Jesus? We are the same. That should have been a stronger amen. Amen. And the question is, what are we exhibiting in that room? The church was unified. And some of the hardest people to get to work together are ministry leaders. I'm speaking as a ministry leader. We're opinionated, we're strong, we, we know the Bible, we've read, we've studied, we have our methodologies, we have our systems, but we need to sit down and come together and say, listen, what can AFCO, Light Bears Arise Campus, the Department of Youth, whatever, we all come to the table and say, what can we do to move all these thousands of young people to send them forth into meaningful action for Christ? GYC, we need to be upon a new day. Not just the new year. Yes, it's January 1st, 2012. We don't need a new year. We need a new day. A time where all of a sudden people can look back and say, you know, it was hard before. But now all these ministries are coming together to say, under one purpose, we're not exalting any speaker. We're not exalting any individual. We're just exalting Christ. We're just exalting his mission. And I'm willing to follow any man, any woman who says, I'm ready to see the Lord come. I don't care if my budget is low. We will bring our material goods to the apostles' feet so that each ministry has what they need. Unity always was the same before the Spirit came. The Spirit didn't produce unity. It was there before He came. And it doesn't just apply to ministries. It applies to each of you in your local church. It applies to each of you at your academies or your colleges or your high schools. We all have people we don't sit next to in church. We all have individuals we don't like to talk to or hang out with or that person's just weird and strange or that girl just talks too much or she smells funny or we have all these weird things that we want to say about people as to why we're separated from them. But does the person love Christ? Have they surrendered to the Holy Spirit? Do they want to see Jesus come? Then we are the same. Bible-based. And as long as we experience that division, it will never come. It will never come. We're doing our little thing somewhere in some part of the world, and we may do our thing in that part of the world. But when we are willing to come and sit down and say, you know what? I can put some opinions aside. I can put some things aside. That was essential. It was always the same. Number two, we see a sense of boldness. Go to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. I have to hurry up to my conclusion. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. The Bible says, now when they saw the what? The boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been what? They had been with who? Jesus. Now I want you to understand, one of the elements that always accompanies the filling of the Holy Spirit is boldness. What is it? Boldness. Boldness. You know, I remember... A few years ago at GYC, Justin was preaching, and I was sitting in the audience listening to Justin's opening address, and I remember as Justin was preaching, that's when 3BN had cameras on the stage, and the camera kind of rocked up on Justin. It was really close, and while Justin was there, in the middle of his speech, he was making a powerful point, and he says, can you back up? And I remember thinking in my mind, this brother is bold. (laughs) He just told a cameraman on camera, on live, can you just back up? Now, I want to say this is that, to me, that's the kind of boldness we need, that unashamedness. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, that's just a nice, okay, ha, ha, ha kind of story, but we need it in reality. Not just in times of, hey, that makes me personally uncomfortable. We need it because it makes Jesus uncomfortable. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes or no? Boldness. 
And notice what the Bible says. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and that they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. You see, are there not certain attributes that you can tell that someone has been with someone else? Yes or no? You see, I, I, as a preacher, I'm always very sensitive to other preachers and their idiosyncrasies. And, you know, you can tell a certain preacher that, you know, I love Pastor Ashrick. You know, the Lord used him to bring me into the church. But, you know, he has some mannerisms, right? You know, he likes to <laughs> across the stage. Or his hand kind of goes like this sometimes when he's talking. And it's so interesting that I go somewhere else and I see someone preaching and I see them doing what I see Pastor Ashrick doing. Or I love Mark Finley, one of my favorite preachers as well. And sometimes when Elder Finley's preaching, his leg kind of moves. You ever seen that before? And he's kind of bouncing and his leg is moving. And I've seen somebody preach and their leg was moving. And you say, when I see this person, their leg is moving, or I see them, you know, walking across the stage like Pastor Ashrick, I take note of them that they have been with Pastor Ashrick or Mark Finley. Are you with me? You see, when they see boldness, they're saying, listen, we took note that these men must have been with Jesus because of the boldness that they're speaking to us. Are you understanding? When they saw the boldness, he didn't say when they saw, you know, they speak so eloquently. They're so kind. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of these people that are, that are uh, you know, very patient and, and all those things are associated with Christ. And I'm not doubting that. But the book of Acts highlights the fact that what was needed in an environment that was polemically against the gospel required boldness. If people in the secular world can be bold, we can be bold. I remember before I became a Christian, I get on the bus to go somewhere, I'm rocking my hip-hop music super loud. Not only is it super loud, I'm also singing it out loud, and you got to endure it on the bus. Or you're driving up to a stoplight, I know this has happened to you, and you're waiting at the stoplight and the car pulls up and his music is so loud, you roll up your windows and you can still hear his music, and it's shaking your whole car. They're bold. So guess what I do? When I walk up to the light, he's bumping his music. I say, okay, let me put in my How Great Thou Art. <laughs> and I turn it up. Why can't we be bold? Amen? Amen? Why can't I get on the bus and sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound? Amen. I'm not ashamed. And Peter says, I've had an experience with Jesus. You can't keep me quiet. You can't make me stop singing hymns to God because I'm on a bus. Not saying be obnoxious. I'm not saying be overwhelming or steamrolling people. Are you understanding? Don't leave this conference and get on Delta Airlines and start singing when the lady's trying to do the security check. <laughs> talking about I'm bold. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're saying when you're ready for takeoff and you're up in the air, put down your iPad games, put down your iPhone games, open up your Bible. Why are we so afraid to just study our Bibles in the air? Tell you a quick story. Got on an airline, and as I was flying, I get nervous, just like you. You don't know who's going to sit next to you. So like, are they going to be like one of those super angry atheist people? So I take my Bible and kind of put it next to my leg. And then I talk to them first just to see where they are before I bring out my Bible. Yes, even preachers have moments. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, Lord, what's wrong with me? Sebastian, why are you afraid? So I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to put my Bible out. So I pull out my tray table, crack my Bible open and turn on the lamp, and I'm there in the Word. The guy comes in, he says, excuse me, he sits down. Before you know it, he looks at my Bible. He says, oh, so you're a Christian. I say, yes. He says, you know, I was so, he's like, I'm so impressed because I've never seen a person step on the plane and be so comfortable and unashamed with the fact that they wanted to study the Bible. Amen. Before you know it, we were in our conversation with the fact that his wife was divorcing him because he got in, she got into some spiritualism and her spiritual guide told him, hey, you know, it's that time for you to divorce your husband. He's like, what? You listen to a spiritual guide? We've been married for 20 years. 
And she's into spiritual. And he says, Sebastian, I don't know what to do. The tears start coming in his eyes. And he says, these women keep coming to me on these business trips saying, hey, look, I'll be with you. I'll love you. I'll wait for you to settle your divorce with your wife. And he says, I love my wife. I believe God can save my family. Even his children said, dad, if you stay with mom, you're a fool. And he says, but I want to be faithful to what I vowed before God. So we started studying how to deal with temptation, how to deal with the fact that these women are coming. I said, listen, brother, there has no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. Amen. It's not uncommon. It's not unusual. But God is faithful. He's not going to allow you to be tempted above what you are able So the guy started getting encouraged. We started having prayer on the plane. We're landing. We're still praying. And they're like, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for flying with us, et cetera, et cetera. He gives me his card, and he says, you have no idea how much I needed this conversation. All because I was willing to take out my Bible. I have to end. Very, very soon. (laughs) Let me give you these very quickly. We said boldness. We said power of their words is the next one. We see that when Peter preached, it cut to the heart. The fifth thing is they had a great delight in prayer. Number six, they had a passionate love for Scripture. Just type in the word, word, and look for it in the book of Acts. Every time the word is preached, people are baptized. This is what it's about, Bible-based ministry. You don't need any extra gimmicks, nothing else to add. I love the words in in, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where he says, No, uh, Abraham, if you send back Lazarus, to my family, they will believe. And he says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And that is the message of GYC. Let the young people hear the word of God. Take away all, it doesn't take all this stuff. It doesn't take someone coming back from the dead. Let them hear the word of God. Let them hear it preached. Let them see it in its clarity. Let them see it in its Christ-centeredness. Let them see it in its prophetic significance. Passionate love for Scripture. And this is where I'm going to end. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now, when? Now, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. The last point to make is when the Holy Spirit is poured out, the ministry extends into unentered fields. He says, listen, yes, Peter has gone, he visited Cornelius, but now I want you to separate me, said the Holy Spirit. Separate me, Saul and Barnabas, that they may do the work that I've called them to do. And if there's one thing, brothers and sisters, that definitely was happening in the book of Acts, was an extension of the work to other fields, to other parts of the world. You see, GYC, we are upon the edge of a new day. We're upon the edge of a new day of young people that have a passionate love for Scripture. We are upon the new day all over the world who 
are young people who take a great delight in prayer. We are upon a new day that young people say, look, we're about unity. We don't care about black and white conference. We don't care about what country you're from. We don't care. All we care about is, do you love the Word of God? Do you love Jesus? Do you want to see Him come in your lifetime? And are you willing to die trying? That's what this is about. And we cannot be here another 10 years. We can't be coming back recycling themes. Oh yeah, we're going to change it around. Not fill me, empty me, Lord. And I don't even say this to be funny because it will break my heart if I have to walk in another convention center only to say, oh, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary of GYC. It is not a celebration because it means these points in the book of Acts have been lost. They were the ones who took the gospel to their known world. And it began with being filled with the Holy Spirit. But the danger is that we will resist. A new day, GYC Europe. A new day, young people got to GYC by faith. Drove down and call-portered for money to get to GYC. To come by faith. One tank of gas. All the way from California. When young people all over the world are starting movements in various countries. When you have young people, even in Guam, trying to raise money and creating videos so that they can be at this conference. What is it in a young person's heart who's 12, 13, 14 says, I want $3,000 to go to this conference because I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't tell me God is not preparing a people. The question is, are we a part of that? You see, it is time. We dawn upon a new day where people leave GYC and realize the revolution continues in 2012 in Seattle, but it begins January 1st in Houston. The world must know we are upon a new day. No longer do we go back just to our local churches. Praise God for Cameron's appeal last night. We're not going back to our local churches for more of the same. Just to be fitting in in the back complaining about a boring sermon. We're going back to say, Lord, we're going to get involved. This is Christ's church, and I am Christ, and I will be involved. That's what we're going back. We're going back to say, no, 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 the church is upon a new day in South America. The church is on a new day in the Middle East. The church is dawning upon a new day in Europe. It's dawning upon a new day in Africa, where all of a sudden no longer GYC If I asked many of you, I said, are you a part of GYC? Many of you would say, no, that's Justin McNeilis, that's Amy Shepard, that's Yamil Rosario, that's Natasha Neblet. And I'm telling you, no, we need a new day. GYC is a generation. It is not an e-com. You don't attend GYC, you are a part of it. If you are a generation that says, look, when someone asks, does there exist an army of young people? who desire to be rightly trained, filled with the Holy Spirit, to take the gospel to all the world in this generation, what is your answer? If you are that generation, then you are GYC. Then you are the generation of youth for Christ. Success in any line demands a definite aim. And he who would achieve true success in life must keep his aim steadily in view. And such an aim has been set before the youth of our day. The heaven-appointed purpose of taking the gospel to all the world in this generation. It is the most noble aim that can appeal to any human being. Is there a youth that is passionate about the Word of God Is there a youth that says, Lord, I want a great delight in prayer? Is there a youth that is willing to be with Jesus and be bold? Is there a youth that looks back and says, you know what? This mission, this message, this Christ, it will not only be the first words of 2011, it'll be the last. Is there a youth 
that says the revolution has begun. Amen. It started in Acts. But is it continuing? I read a quote as the pianist plays that says, life is too short to live the same day twice. Life is too short to live the same day twice. You see, when you believe Jesus is coming, I believe Jesus is coming, then we cannot live the same. We cannot go back home right now and do more of the same. We can't go back and submit the same kind of proposals to the church board. We can't go back with the same Bible studies. Go on that website, go on GYC web and say, look, I heard this seminar, download, listen to it, and then give it. No preacher has a copyright on the Word of God. Jesus inspired it first. You take that sermon, it touched you, it will touch other young people. And literally, let's not be a young army that's standing in our hub, that's coming together and say, we are an army of youth. When there's a war, when there's an army, the only thing left is to be deployed, sent forth into meaningful action. Life is too short to live the same day twice. A new day. We cannot continue as we were. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. And I'm going to make some very, very specific appeals. And my first appeal is that young person that all conference long, you have been struggling with the Holy Spirit, and He's asking you to surrender right now. And you're saying, Lord, I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of resisting. I want you to come up out of your seat. Come up front and say, I need to give my life to Christ. I've been fighting the Holy Spirit. Come. However young, however old, I've been fighting the Holy Spirit. Come out of your seat and surrender to Jesus. You've been cherishing sin. You've been fighting the Lord. You've been resisting the convicting messages. Come. Jesus will accept you just as you are. I've been fighting the Holy Spirit and I'm ready to surrender. No longer, Lord, am I going to fight you. I'm not going to fight the Holy Spirit anymore. Come. We have people to welcome you, to get your name, give you a card to fill that out. I'm not fighting the Holy Spirit anymore. My second call is for individuals in this room who says, I am a ministry leader and I'm willing to come to the table to sit down with other ministry leaders and discuss how we can move this movement forward. You say, yes, I want to sit down with other ministry leaders and help move this movement forward. I want you to come right to my right side, right here by the piano. I am a leader of a ministry and I'm willing to sit down, come right by the cameraman. I'm a leader of a ministry and I'm willing to come and sit down with other ministry leaders and figure out how can we move this work forward. I'm a leader of a ministry and I'm willing to come, come all the way to the right. Those of you who said I'm, 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 I've been fighting the Holy Spirit, just slide over a little bit to the left. I want to be very clear who those ministry leaders are because we want to get their names. We want to get their information, and we want them to sit down and talk. I'm a leader of a ministry, and I'm willing to sit down and come to the table and talk. How can we move this thing forward together? 
My third appeal is for that young person that says, you know what? I think God has been calling me like Paul and Barnabas. And it's true, we need missionaries in North America. I don't doubt it. I support it. But I believe that God is calling some people to go to some foreign countries on missions. To enter into new fields yet unentered. And you say, Lord, I think you're calling me. The Spirit is saying, separate me and your name comes up. Come to the left side. The Lord is calling to separate me right here to the left side. To foreign missions overseas. Just come to the left. Want to get your name, contact information. Separate me. And you say, Lord, I feel called to go to foreign missions. I sense the Spirit calling me. Come to the left. Come right over here to the left. I sense that the Lord is calling me to foreign missions. Come right here. And I want to make sure someone has the buckets with the cards. We can get them cards to get their names. I feel called to go overseas. The Lord is saying, separate me. He's going to send some Pauls and some Barnabases overseas. And lastly, can I give you a challenge, GYC? If you want to say, Lord, in Seattle, we start on Friday night. This is foreign missions. Lord, we start on Friday night in Seattle, and we want this revolution to start today, right now. And that is not a revolution against governments. It's not a revolution against the, the structure of the church. This is a revolution against the oppression of Satan. And there are souls that are dying. And so can we give a challenge, GYC? And this is my challenge. That by Friday night next year, your prayer, your aim, your desire, and your efforts will be built towards this aim. I want to bring at least one soul to Christ. That's the challenge I want to give. At least one soul. I don't care if you do the backstage managing. I don't care if you do the cameras, if you do a, the chorus thing, if you're setting up the chairs or you're an usher at the door. By next year, GYC, we're saying, Lord, I want to make at least one person help them to become a disciple of Jesus. Are you willing to make that commitment? Friday, 2012 in Seattle. Lord, help me to bring at least one. If you're willing to make that commitment with me, I just invite you to kneel as we pray. And ideally, bring them to Seattle. They don't have to be baptized yet, but they're a disciple of Jesus. They have cherished Christ above all others. And if you want to kneel with me and say, Lord, help us as a movement to move, then kneel with me and let's seek God together and ask Him for help to bring one soul to the feet of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you see those who have come. Lord, there are some things that are always the same. When your spirit fills us, a passion for scripture, unity, boldness, a delight in prayer, the extension of your work into unentered areas. And Father, you see these young people who have come. 
and you're not surprised. Before they were formed in the womb, you knew them. And before they came forth, you had ordained them. Father, help the revolution to begin today. And for those who have come up to say, Lord, we're no longer fighting the Spirit. Grant them the peace that comes with those who surrender. Teach us, Lord, how to rest in the love of God, to trust you with unquestioning confidence, to keep all our cares, all our sorrows before God, for we cannot weary him because he holds up worlds. And may we no longer fight, Lord, the Spirit of God. And that that sweet, sweet Spirit would come. Father, we pray for the leaders of ministries who have come forward and to say we're willing to sit down to see how we can move this movement forward. Yes, we have a work to do in our respective ministries, but we're interested in what can be done collectively and finding unity amongst ourselves. Father, it is our prayer that the Spirit of Christ would hover over that group of, of individuals. They are individuals of influence. They are individuals that have a passion for your work already, and they have already moved and sent forth young people into the work. And it is our prayer that you would hedge them in and that unity that comes out of their collaboration, may heaven know it was those meetings and those prayers that moved the work forward. Father, we pray for those going on foreign missions. You've separated them for such a time. We cannot even foresee the journey that lays before them. Keep them strong. Keep them faithful, not to be as Ananias and Sapphira, to keep back what they have vowed to God, but to give what the Spirit has impressed them to give. And lastly, Father, we kneel, asking as a generation of youth for Christ, that by Friday next year, Seattle, you will help us to lead at least one soul to become a disciple of Jesus. They may not be baptized. They may not understand the fullness of the depths of all the beautiful truths in our church. But may they be disciples. And if possible, we pray even now, heaven and its angels would set into motion providences, souls that we can find that are open for truth and longing for guidance and come back in Seattle and say, this time, Lord, we have not come alone. As we end, we do not pray for angels to come down. We do not pray for unfallen beings. We pray for the Spirit, the sweet, sweet Spirit. Fill us. Fill us till we want no more. This is our prayer. And we trust that you will help this to be our experience. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. As you exit, if you have a card, just drop it in the buckets. There's buckets on the floor. There's buckets in the back in the middle aisles. So if you have filled out a card, put those cards in a bucket before you leave. Before you leave, we ask that you return to your seats. We have one more opportunity to have a season of prayer. Please return to your seats. I believe that the thing that makes GYC the experience at GYC great is not the speakers, it's not the sermons themselves, but it is that we encounter God. And as we depart from this place, we have a promise that God will never leave us nor forsake us and that He has sent His Spirit, His Comforter, to be with us. 
And so we're going to have two short prayers as we've done throughout the conference, individual prayers, and then a small group prayer. And it would be appropriate that we pray that God's Spirit would be with us throughout the year, that this experience that we've had with Him would remain. That when we leave this place, we would not leave this experience, that our, our fire that is burning within our hearts would not grow cold, but that it would continue burning because His Spirit, because He is present with us. And so as we kneel, we invite you to kneel wherever you're at, and we'll begin a short prayer individually in our hearts, that God's Spirit would remain with us, that our conviction would remain strong, that the decisions that we've made would remain true throughout this year. Please kneel. We'll have just a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will close. Holy Father, we are not worthy to come before you except that we can claim the blood of Christ who died for us. And because we have experienced your presence here, we long to remain true to the decisions that have been made. We long that when we leave this place, we would not grow cold, we would not settle back into the lives that we had before, but that we would a revolution today would begin that would continue. And we know that that is not by might nor by power. It's not by our resolve, Father, but it is by your Spirit. And so we pray your Spirit be poured out on us now to strengthen our resolve and keep us true. For this is our prayer, not because we deserve it, but because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask that you remain kneeling as you turn to the person next to you and we'd like to pray now for each other that we surrender the things that we are holding on to um, that prevent us from receiving in a fuller sense the Holy Spirit. I'll give you a few moments to pray uh, with the person next to you and then I'll offer a short prayer. Father in heaven, we're told that the Holy Spirit is like the wind, that we cannot see him, but that we can see his effects. And Father, when we look at those who responded to tonight's appeal, we cannot help but believe that the Holy Spirit was here among us. But Father, um, we confess that we're sinful and there are still things in our hearts that we hold on to. Lord, we ask that you give us the desire and the resolve to surrender those things to Jesus, to believe that Jesus is sufficient. Father, we have failed so many times, but Lord, we ask 
that you give us a de desire to continue to look to Jesus only. And Father, we trust that you'll hear and answer this prayer. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please return to your seats.
Well, it's over. GYC is over. I have the privilege, I guess, for the final announcements. Uh, we'll make them brief because I know you'll have places to go, maybe flights to catch buses or vans to get on. Uh, the first is lost and found. We're missing a green purse. If you find the green purse, take it to the Hilton, the front desk there. There's a little bit of a lost and found there. Second is this. You see these beautiful flowers? You can take them. You cannot take the vase. Do not touch the vase. We promised them we wouldn't touch them. You take the flower out gently. You don't touch the vase, and you can take it with you. Okay? As soon as we dismiss, you can come and get flowers. Our little gift to you. Uh, Oklahoma. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a guy that literally took a faith trip. He does not have a ride back. If there's someone going to Oklahoma, please meet Larry beside the piano. He is on a faith trip. He needs an answer to prayer, which may be someone in this room, to get him back. Dr. Chung, Kathy Irizari, or Alan Parker, please go backstage if you're here. Some of you have been asking, audio recordings, where can we get them? Where can you get them? Interesting. <laughs> GYCweb.org. Go there, they're all on there. GYCweb.org. Where are you going to go? GYCweb.org. GYCweb.org. Some are up there, some are coming. Uh, we just have this bad, I don't know all the technology terms of it, but it's not a big enough pipe to be able to get them all up. So some are up, some are going up. GYCweb.org. The last thing is this. Uh, some of you have volunteered. We got little water bottles with a GYC logo on. If you volunteered and you did not get a water bottle, please go to the side. Uh, over there somewhere is the water bottles. Pick those up. GYC is over. Next year, our theme is? Acts Sounds so good. All right, executive committee, front row. Let's go, let's go. Acts, the revolution continue. What's unique about next year? Starts on Friday, ends on Tuesday. Now, Seattle is a city, to state the obvious. Our president, Elder Wilson, is making a push for the cities. The union in Seattle is making a push for that city to be reached. Did you know people from Seattle are here at this conference? We've already started working with them. They want a huge evangelism thrust in Seattle. You can be a part of that. We need you to come. We need the revolution, as Sebastian said, not to start there, but to start today. Here's the final appeal, and it's short. You came here as an individual, as a person. If you leave here the same individual, the same person you were when you got here, you will be doing God a disservice. He's no doubt touched you some way throughout this meeting. He's no doubt touched you some way throughout this conference. If you go back and, and, as we saw opening night, slip into the crowd like Peter, avoid the awkward eye contact, you'll be doing a disservice. Don't leave here the same person you were when you got here. That's our final appeal. Let's just have a little closing prayer. I'll jump down and join my beautiful team. Come talk to us, meet us, and if we don't talk to you here, we hope to see you in Seattle. The revolution continues. Let's pray. Father, we pray to conclude this conference. You've poured out your blessings here. We've felt your presence here. We've felt the Holy Spirit here. Lord, we realize that many of us came here with maybe struggles in our life, or perhaps just a lack of vision. Lord, many of us have been inspired. 
We've made commitments to adjust things in our life. We've made commitments to do great things for you. Lord, hold us accountable to those decisions that we've made. Don't let us go back to our homes or our workplaces, the same people that we were. Change us. Lord, we just thank you for these opportunities to learn more about you. Uh, we thank you for the privilege that it is to come together from 49 different states, 66 different countries, and worship you. Lord, when we go back and the lights are off and the cameras are switched off and the ties are unloosened and we're just alone with you and our thoughts, may we be faithful faithful to you, our Creator. May we be found faithful, faithful, faithful. Let all of God's people say amen.